It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Puris coming to you from Baltimore. Accusations of sexual harassment and of sexual violence have surfaced with increasing frequency these days from movie producer Harvey Weinstein to actor Kevin Spacey to Republican senatorial candidate Roy Moore and very recently to Democratic Senator Al Franken. Of course, we should not forget the numerous other allegations that have also been made against, uh, say, President uh, Donald Trump or Bill Clinton and numerous other incidences that have risen in the history of this issue. The details of the sexual harassment accusations may differ, but one constant factor is the powerful uh, perpetrator, usually in the context of a workplace situation. Joining me now to analyze the recent wave of accusations and what can be done about sexual harassment is Alex Press. Alex is an assistant editor at Jacobin and PhD student in sociology at Northeastern University. She recently penned an article for Jacobin and for In These Times about this issue. Thanks for joining us today, Alex. Thank you for having me. So Alex, as I mentioned in the introduction, what almost all of these cases of sexual harassment have in common is that they happened in a workplace context where the perpetrator was in a position of power. In your article for Jacobin, you argue that while individual women speaking out is a good first step, this is not enough. Instead, we need to take collective action against sexual harassment. Um, explain what you meant by that. Sure. So I try to demonstrate in the Jacobin piece and elsewhere in other articles that, you know, when you're a one woman or less often a man facing sexual harassment or sexual abuse in the workplace, you have a lot to lose when you speak out by yourself. And so I advocate, you know, specifically for unions as the best vehicle for addressing these issues, but really any collective action amongst your colleagues or across other workplaces helps provide a safety for the victim themselves so that they don't have to go up against the boss, don't have to risk repercussions alone. They have people next to them who say, you know, you can't fire us all. We stand with this person. Um, so I, I address that in the piece through my own experiences, but also I think you could apply it to a lot of the cases we've seen in the media lately, um, where if it's just one one woman accusing, there's a, there's a potential for a lot of backlash. But as, as we see more and more women come forward, it becomes harder to, you know, to discredit the accuser. So Alex, um, if we were to apply this to one of the mo uh, more prominent cases of sexual harassment, the accusations against Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein, um, a lot of people have come out and supported the women who've complained and uh, gone public uh, with their allegations. Um, is this the kind of collective action you're talking about? And uh, uh, if so, that's great. And, and then what can be done to elaborate on such uh, collective action? Sure. So I think the public support for these women in that case has been really important. Um, you know, a huge part of why women aren't coming forward in a lot of industries is the assumption that they'll be discredited and seen as, you know, the problem maker rather than someone who's fighting for the industry to be better. So I think in this case, you know, that's a, that's a great and important thing. Um, it has a real, I think, strong effect when other women see that's the response and know that they won't be sort of completely discredited or shunned. Um, I think that brings people to speak out more. Um, that said, uh, some of the conversation around the Weinstein case specifically has drawn in what the union in Hollywood could have done. So SAG after uh, specifically being the Screen Actors Guild that represents most of, if not all of the victims in these cases. Um, and some of that conversation I think has been really productive in that actors, including Mia Kirshner, who's a Canadian actress, Morgan, uh, um, uh, Morgan, I can't remember his last name. He wrote a piece for us um, about this issue where they talk about what SAG-AFTRA could have done and what it didn't do. 
And I think that's a really productive place for, for the conversation to move. Alex, uh, elaborate on the kind of activities that the union could be engaged in in order to prevent this kind of workplace harassment. Sure. So the specific case of SAG-AFTRA and Harvey Weinstein, you know, there, there's a couple things that have been laid out as, as changes SAG-AFTRA could make. Um, so the president of SAG-AFTRA recently in a piece in Politico, she was quoted saying that a lot of these cases happened off the clock. These were women who, you know, the disgusting image of like the casting couch of Hollywood where it's off hours and you're invited to a bar or a hotel room to talk to someone powerful. So, you know, the president said, look, our contracts regulate on the job hours and there's nothing we necessarily can do at the moment about what happens off the clock. Um, and I think part of, you know, her quote there was, was acknowledging that there needs to be a change and a recognition of the real conditions of the workplace and in that industry it isn't enough to just talk about what's happening on a set say or you know in an office um, and so i think one thing sag aftra is probably considering um, and again i'm not in sag aftra so i don't know the you know how this is how this is functioning internally but they're considering whether there's a way to track retaliation against women who've brought these cases and what to do about that retaliation. So can you blacklist a set that's run by someone who has retaliated against victims in the same way that SAG-AFTRA will send do not work notices about non-union sets? The same thing could be done about men that are, say, um, blacklisting certain women or you know, their supporters from um, work. So that's, that's one example, but certainly just in a very narrow sense of you know, taking away a legalistic view of this problem and, and a sort of bringing together the women and men that are, you know, really fired up about this moment, willing to put in quite a bit of work to to address the issue and, and bringing in those, you know, the more people thinking about the issue and, and giving input, the better. So, you know, I, I'm quite sure that SAFTRA is doing that right now. And certainly I know that other unions are doing the same thing. Right. And in your article, you go further, especially in the one in these times, you point out that sexual harassment is also an issue for the left, that too often left tends to bury accusation of sexual harassment within the movement or organizations in the name of advancing other issues. Um, how pervasive do you feel that, that this is a problem in the left today and what can we do to address it? Sure. So um, I think any conversation about how this ha happens is left, you know, it has to start with an acknowledgement that we all exist in an incredibly, you know, patriarchal society in which we're surrounded by this poor, poor behavior, this unacceptable behavior. So it would be a miracle if it didn't happen in the left, right? That would be incredible, but it does. Um, and so, you know, the idea that it happens more or less, I think it is bizarre it probably happens less on the left because we take these things seriously but it does happen um i don't think you know especially in this moment i think there's a real attempt to get rid of this instinct to to cover these incidents up or to talk about them really pri privately in hopes of you know not tarring the broader movement or what campaigns we're working on um, and there have been cases recently of this being dealt with and i think a really a positive light um, as for what we can do you know, I, I lay out in the article you're referencing for in these ends that, you know, it, part of it has to be a change to the, to the instinct about if someone raises this, it's harmful. I think if we if we start acknowledging that raising these issues within whether it's a union or a social movement campaign or anywhere else, we have to realize that that's about building a stronger left, right? We don't want men that might endanger our campaign by, you know, giving a gift to the right. We don't want them leading our movements. So this is about strengthening a, you know, a left that can actually win and sustain power. Um, so I think that song that is still being argued, I'm certainly arguing it in a lot of left spaces. Uh, I think everyone on the left is largely in agreement that sexual harassment is not okay morally or ethically, but the idea that it's strategically also you know, a huge problem in our movements, that's an argument that still has to be won.
And this is a big issue in the left. Um, you know, I, I refer back to conversations about, uh, or articles that have been written about um, the unhappy marriage between uh, Marxism and feminism, or socialism and feminism, and that the greater issue of class is utmost importance of utmost importance and therefore gender and gender issues are buried underneath the overall class struggle. Um, the, uh, the conversations you're referring to that needs to happen is a, is a good thing, but how do we actually force this and rupture um, the issue to come to the forefront of debate and discussion? So to start, you know, I don't think that there, you know, there's this strong narrative right now in in the past few years of, you know, socialism or Marxism being at, at odds with a feminist approach. And I think fortunately we're seeing a lot of incredibly strong, smart, particularly mostly women um, who are showing that these two things go hand in hand, that there is a real, uh, you know, all of these issues, whether it's sexual harassment or anything else that is, you know, seen as a gendered or, or women's issue, that these are completely about how workers are kept over exploited and underpaid and that this is you know not any different than a class issue um so that said you know i think what we can do is ensure that in our space you know it would have to be a more specific example of what you do because it's case to case if you're a publication or an organization or a union you have very clear pro processes in place that show that these are there are channels to raise grievances DSA, for example, which is an organization I'm a member of, recently passed a grievance procedure that is incredibly specific about how you will step by step address a grievance about sexual harassment or sexual assault should it come up. Um, and I think having very clear cut channels like that um, is, is de definitely a first step in more formal organizations. The question of the broader left is much harder, right? It's amorphous kind of movement. Um, you know, that is as much about cultural change as it is about anything else, right? So having leadership that takes this seriously and having it be an impediment to your leadership if it's shown that you don't, um, I think is a really clear way to address this. Um, but when we're talking about complete volunteer labor in, in a movement, you know, there is there is no policy you can put in place other than the trust that this is going to be taken seriously if and when it does come up. Right. And um, finally, um, Alex, um, when yeah. I grew up a few decades ago, it was more uh, the, the women's movement was stronger on these issues. I mean, you saw huge campaigns on violence against women, dom uh, domestic violence, uh, workplace harassment, and so on. Much of that has died down recently. We don't see the same kinds of campaigns that were there in the 80s and 90s. Um, why is that so? Well, I think there is a real dearth of a feminist movement. You know, sometimes in my most despairing moments, I say we have no feminist movement. And so why that is, I think, is as much about that movement's kind of shift into nonprofits and very close ties to, you know, establishment politicians and, and losing track of the radical roots of being willing to, to confront power, being willing to, you know, make trouble, um, to push for things in the streets rather than in legislative initiatives only. Um, as for today, you know, I think there is there's a clear need for such a movement again, right? And I think it's hard to talk about women's issues without talking about probably what is affecting people the most right now, which is the, the attack on reproductive rights. So when we talk about the feminist movement, it's hard to say we even have one when, when we've seen those rights be taken more and more away every year over the past few years. So I think there's, you know, there's a mix of reasons for why um, the feminist movement doesn't exist in the same way. Um, but certainly I hope to use the growing energy and interest in the left broadly that we've seen since the Sanders campaign and, and, and build a left that actually incorporates from the start a feminist analysis instead of trying to, in the future, um, glean one onto an existing left. All right, Alex, I thank you so much for joining us today. An interesting conversation, um, which I hope to continue. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yep. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.